Welcome to one of the most listened to music news podcasts in the world, SGNP, with your host, Darren Sutherland. Join us as we talk with industry leaders, artists, and entertainers about their faith, family, and careers. This is information you will not find anywhere else on radio, web, or in a magazine, but only firsthand on SGNP. Well, Les, I think was a tank commander or something. And uh, he said, then he had to write his brother a letter and say, don't you come over here. He said, man, those people are getting blowed up and killed all around me. <laughs> but he didn't want his mama to know it. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome, for their farewell appearance at the National Quartet Convention, the legendary Florida Boys. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Somewhat emotional moment for all of us. I'm sure you must realize that. I want to thank all of you who have made it possible for us to eat down through the years. <laughs> we might have been able to eat a little better, but you let, we, we got fat enough as it was, and we do appreciate you. I want to sing a song that I guess would be our signature song. We recorded it 20-something years ago, I think. How long ago, Dina? 84. Uh, it features a, a young fellow from Alabama by the name of Terry Davis. And I remember that um, when we were going to record this song, he said, I have a special feeling for this song. I'd like to have a word of prayer before we sing it. And we did, and he led the prayer. We sang the song, and a miracle happened. We got it on the first cut. That doesn't hardly ever happen. First cut, no remix, and we want to do it for you tonight. Features Terry Davis. Of course, Buddy Lyles is with us. He was with us for 26 years. Be glad to see him. If you are, let's let him know. So this is a group that actually recorded this song, so let's sing it. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I'm not all an ego trip I'm nothing on my own I make mistakes and I often slip Just common flesh and bone But I'll prove someday what I say I'm of a special kind When he was on the I was always mine I look at love on his face and the thorns were on his head the blood was on that scarlet robe and stained in crimson red though his eyes were on the crowd that day I was a 
You know, when we started this podcast, we never dreamed it would grow and things would happen like that. So we got us a sponsor of the show, My Pillow, one of the f- sponsors that have helped. And My Pillow's doing a great job. Not only did they send me a premium pillow, which we could try, I took it with me when we went to Philadelphia a few weeks ago in the truck. And Jonathan, my producer, was in the truck. And Jonathan sleeps at the drop of a hat. And Jonathan, you laid your head on the My Pillow and went to sleep, didn't you? I did. And did you wake up? Up. I did wake up. When? When I slammed on the brakes to scare you. That's right. That's right. So that's the only thing that woke him up was me slamming on the brakes. You want a my pillow? They got a great four pack offer right now. Fifty percent off two premium pillows and two go anywhere pillows comes with it. A great offer. Four pack offer. Fifty percent off two premium pillows and two go anywhere pillows. Call them today. One eight hundred three three eight two three three zero. That's one eight hundred three three eight two three three zero. Use the code. S-G-N-P. Again, that's S-G-N-P. Christmas is coming. Order your pillows now for folks. Support gospel music and support S-G-N-P. Or as always, you can go to their website, MyPillow.com, but always enter the code S-G-N-P. Jonathan, did you sleep better on a MyPillow? I certainly did. Do you hope they send you one? I would love one. There we go. And welcome to this special edition of S-G-N-P. Arthur, how you doing, my friend? Doing good. Doing all right. Thanksgiving week. Yesterday was a great day at Thanksgiving. I know it was probably great for you guys, and you guys are getting ready to be hard at work at Dollywood during the Christmas season, working day and night. uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Getting things going. We've actually been doing Christmas for a couple weeks now, so (laughs) (laughs) it's always hard to sing Christmas songs before Thanksgiving. And and you know what? This has turned into be uh, rather – Probably our busiest week ever at SGMP, Arthur. Arthur, you and I usually talk one hour a week. We schedule the guests. We get them on the phone. We talk to them for 30 to 45 minutes. But we probably texted back and forth this week more than any other. And it's because yeah. of this special show we're doing right here in tribute to an icon of gospel music passing away Saturday night, Les Beasley. And, yes. uh, you know, this show's longer than any show we've ever done, but there's a reason why it's longer than anyone we've ever done is because there's so many great people of influence that uh, we wanted to have share a little bit about less. Coming up on today's show, Arthur, we've got Ed Harper, we've got Kelly Nealon, we've got Maurice Templeton, we've got uh, Josh Garner. We've got Gene McDonald. We've got Tim Lovelace. We've got Randy Shellnut Sr. And we got Ray Dean Reese. And I mean, we could probably call and literally get 20 other people on the phone to make comments oh, about, absolutely. about Les and the impact he's had on their careers. And uh, we were scheduled to talk to your friend. And we'll talk a little bit more about that after some of the interviews. And when we close the show out, but Arthur, on a personal aspect, um, tell me, you know, how, how did you meet Les Beasley? What was your first recollection of when you met Les Beasley? Well, I met Les, uh, you know, years ago when I was young, you know, they used to come to Asheville and, and sing, uh, you know, the all night singing the Kingsman put on. And that's where I, I met Les, of course, you know, I was just a kid and just a fan back then, you know. And then when I went with the Kingsman, you know, we were with the same booking agent. And and so we worked a lot together, and, and we worked a lot for J.G. Whitfield. And, uh, you know, J.G. Whitfield did a lot of concerts back in, in the early 80s. And, and uh, you know, had us and the Florida Boys and Dixie Echoes and, and uh, different groups. But uh, that was really when I kind of, got to know Les and man what a just a great guy just a just a gentleman and uh you know he he acted like you know first time I met him you know acted like he knew me forever and he he always knew you know just always took time to talk and and uh just encouraged me and 
they're just a great guy. Uh, Arthur, let's take a break right here and listen to what Maurice Templeton, Ed Harper, and Kelly Nealon have to say about when they first met Les Beasley. You know what? Um, I, I don't re- really remember meeting him. I've just always known him. I mean, he was uh, in my life from the day I was born. And so I do remember being at a concert, uh, very early age, maybe four. And, uh, he remembers it too. Uh, I would go up and I would tug on his, uh, pants leg because I was kind of shy and I wanted him to hold me. And, and, uh, I remember that. Uh, so it's been a long time. I don't ever remember meeting him. He's just been there. Well, Les actually, I met through my late father, Herman Harper. He, uh, my father sang with the Oak Ridge Boys back in the 50s and 60s, and he and Les became very good friends back then. So that's really when I met Les for the first time. I was a very young child, and uh, when my father uh, retired from the road from the Oak Ridge Boys uh, about 50 years ago, he immediately went uh, started booking with Don Light Talent, and uh, Don Light was already representing the Florida Boys. So... That's sort of where I, uh, how I got to know Les, and then I really got to know him uh, on a much greater level back in January of 1982 when I got into the booking business. Of course, everybody met him, I think, through the singing Jubilee, you know, on Sunday morning back in the 50s, and there was nothing on TV, nothing at all. The TV stations didn't even open until noon, and Les started that singing jubilee and that thing caught on and actually that's where everybody met him and was introduced to him but i personally met him when i bought the singing news i was coming down interstate 81 one time and i looked over and i saw the florida boys i hadn't known singing news six months and i saw the florida boys bus on the side of the road and i pulled off the interstate and I went over there and Les Beasley was under that bus. <laughs> and I introduced myself and that's how we got started. Great comments about Les from uh, Maurice, Ed, and Kelly. Um, you know, there's some great memories out there about Les Beasley. What sticks out in your mind? I, I know my, th- this is going to sound crazy, Arthur, and I've always come up with crazy analogies and you know this. Uh-huh. But to me, Les Beasley growing up was the face of gospel music. When you thought of gospel music, you thought of Les Beasley. That was the brand because of the gospel singing Jubilee when I was growing up in Atlanta, Georgia. It was on on Sunday mornings. And it was Jubilee, Jubilee. And I never will forget, I loved when the Hensons came on to Jubilee. You know why? Because they had drums. And I didn't want to see the Florida boys. I wanted to see the Hensons because they had the drummer. And uh, then the Goodmans, of course, came along with Rick. But that's that's my first less memory. What's your first less memory? That was probably uh, my first memory was was uh, golf singing Jubilee because you're you're right. It came on every Sunday morning, and I I remember uh, uh, growing up. Uh, you know, we got uh, out of Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, we got it for an hour. Then my dad had a, a, a antenna, and most most of these young people don't know what that is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's up, you know. That's how we used to get TV. You know, we had, and he had a huge antenna. And that thing probably was fifty foot in the air. Yeah. And boy, we were. I mean, we were we were big time. We had one of those rotary dials that sat on top of the TV, and you could turn that antenna and pick up different. TV stations, depending on, you know, where they were. And so we would watch, uh, it came on at eight o'clock on Sunday morning and it was on for an hour. And then at nine o'clock, we could turn that antenna around and we could pick up the station coming out of Knoxville, Tennessee. And it came on at nine there. It was on another hour. And so we got to watch it, you know, again, over and over. And, and uh, so the, just, just great memories, just great memories. Hey, hey. And, and you're right. It introduced so many great uh, uh, um, artist uh, on there that, that a lot of times, you know, we didn't get to see in our area. You know, the Hensons didn't really come 
uh, to our area that much. Uh, the Goodmans came some, but they were, gosh, they were just so big. You know, they, they sung all over the country. And so, you know, we didn't get to see them a whole lot. And, uh, or I didn't, you know, growing up that much, but, but, uh, you know, the, the Rambos and Dixie Echoes, you know, it was just great, uh, just good stuff. Let's take a moment, Arthur, and listen to what some of our friends have to, to say about their greatest Les memory. All of the memories of Les, what a true gentleman he was. I, I just, uh, it's hard for me to pick out one, except he was always, he always greeted me. When I got off of the bus, or he got off of the bus, I waved at him. We greeted one another, uh, always in the uh, auditorium or on stage. It's you know, and he always had that uh, that life. You know, well, how you doing there, Ray Reese? <laughs> you know, after I bought the singing news, and probably the first quartet convention I went to after I bought it, or maybe the second one, I decided I was going to put me out a new calendar. So I, I put a four colored calendar out and uh, had the pictures of all the top groups and a little bit about them. And Les came by my table and he saw those calendars and they were five dollars a piece. And Les says, "Boy, you ain't been in this business long, have you?" <laughs> what are you talking about? He says. Not only can you not sell them calendars, you can't give them things away. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty unique. And tell you the truth, that's happened. People not interested in calendars. Another thing he said was on one of the groups, I don't remember whether it's Karen Pack or Kelly Nealon or one of them, was going to start a group. He said, let me tell you something. If you don't have $50,000 in the bank, and you own a bus, he said, you're bankrupt before you ever start. <laughs> and that was so truthful. Oh, my goodness. I have so many memories. One of my favorites is being on the Singing at Sea cruise with all of the groups and the Florida boys and Les Beasley. He was a prankster, and he loved to stir up a little trouble, and he knew my daddy was very, very strict, and they had a... <laughs> They had a hula hoop contest, a hula hoop contest, and Les wanted me to be in it. And I said, "Well, I can't. Daddy will get mad at me." And he said, "I'll do it with you." And I knew I was going to get in big trouble. And so we got our hula hoops. I, you know, if I, Les told me to do it, I was going to do it. So we we got the hula hoops ready. And when they told us to to go, I just let mine drop. And Les laughed till he cried because he knew I was going to get in big trouble if I had done it. But I did it, but I let it drop. <laughs> well, Les was always funny. He was always truthful. And uh, he uh, you always knew where he stood on things. He may not tell you what you like, but he would always tell you the truth. He was truthful. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier today. I'll never forget, he was at my office years ago, and... Uh, Something was going on or being discussed, and he made the comment, we would all be better off if we would do each other's job for about one day, then we'd have a whole lot more respect and appreciation for what each of us do in this industry. I thought that was very profound. It's always stuck with me. Great memories, great stuff, great, great influential impact Les Beasley had. You know... I've said this, being on the Christian music side of things, not just dealing with gospel music, Arthur, but Les not only had an impact on Southern gospel music, which he loved, and he was a quartet man through and through. And as Maurice will tell you coming up, he fought for quartets in the National Quartet Convention and said, we don't have enough quartets. And he wanted quartets being apart because he was a traditionalist. But he had a huge impact on Christian music as a whole. I mean, folks don't realize this a lot, but the Gospel Music Association, he was a founding member, and he created the Dove Awards. And the yeah. Dove Awards are today, for Christian music, what the Emmys are for television. I mean, yep. 
he was the man who invented the Dove Awards. Yeah. I mean, yep. that's a huge impact. Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, those, you know, those awards at that time, you're like, like you say, that, that was, the, that was the biggest thing uh, that we had is gospel music. Let's listen to some of those impacts. Some of our friends in gospel music will share with us about Les. You know, I think his biggest impact is, um, could possibly be the gospel singing Jubilee. It took our music to a whole new level. Um, put us on uh, national TV. Uh, we would be up on Sunday mornings um, ready to sing at a church, and we could hear the maids listening to the gospel singing Jubilee all the way down the, the halls. And it sure did impact our life um, because as soon as Daddy changed the name from the Lefevers to the Rex Nealon Singers, Les put us on the Jubilee. And in an instant, we were known all over the nation. And uh, I, I would say that and the National Quartet Convention would be just his biggest influence. He was very, very particular about uh, keeping the four-part harmony. He he was not interested in uh, anything. Well, he was interested, I guess, but the 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 four-part harmony was less, that was less his uh, favorite and and not even trios. Uh, even though we got some great trios out there, he liked the four part harmony. And that's what he fought for during the quartet convention. My days with him there, several years we were together. And uh, he'd look down that line at me and say, We need more quartets, we need more quartets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then one night, one time, he talked us into just having quartet music, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's that's where his interest was was in in four part Stamps Baxter type music. I think probably the uh, the TV show, uh, the Gospel Jubilee TV show, had a profound impact, and uh, people still talk about that show today, even though it's been off the air, uh, you know, for the better for thirty thirty five years. Uh, it exposed our music to all over the world back in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. As we come back and we hear those memories, I'm reminded, Arthur, of uh, of a few conversations I had the opportunity to talk to Liss. And, you know, the, the key words that everybody keeps saying is no ego, integrity, and honesty. And... Uh, that's one of the things that gospel music is going to miss most about Les Beasley because you always knew where you stood. And if he told you that it was raining outside, you better get an umbrella and a raincoat because it would be yeah. raining outside. Do you think we need more leaders like that in gospel music? Absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's kind of a different era, but, but yes, we do. And we do have some of those, but it's, uh, you know, I think because of the, uh, you know, times have changed. It's a little different as far as, uh, uh, you know, being able to control a lot of a lot of that stuff. But we do need those leaders and we have some and, and uh, that are uh, that that continue to build this music and and uh, the love for this music. And and uh, but I tell you, Les was just uh, he was just humble guy. You'd never know. Uh, you know, he never flaunted. He never uh, bragged about the accomplishments and that sort of thing that uh, that he did. And and uh, but man, just a just a great guy. Loved this music and and loved the message in music. I'll tell you something else too. I was always respected about Les was uh, his choice. Their choice for songs. And uh, they were always uh, just biblically sound and just uh, great great message in every song that they ever sung especially to be on a national platform like the gospel singing jubilee was and and uh, i remember archie Watkins told me you know when when that was when that program was on you know they could go just about anywhere in the in the country and people would recognize them on the street just because you know they got to know them um 
on on TV every Sunday. They got to see him. They came into their home, and they they were a part of their life, and uh, that uh, that that is just great. You know, one of the things I've learned in doing this show, and I, and I think I'm a pretty good, I've got pretty good knowledge of gospel music just from doing this week after week and loving the music just like you. But one thing that I've learned in doing all these interviews that I never knew before today was one would always assume that Les Beasley owned the Florida Boys outright. Folks didn't realize yeah. that he was actually partners with Daryl Stewart, his piano player, and Glenn Allred, yeah. his bass Glenn player. Allred. His bass player. But yet, Les was the face. Everybody went to Les. Les was the leader. That's true leadership. Don't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's something else. We're going, I'm going to share a few things that some artists has, has shared with us. We're going to hear Maurice and some others tell about the biggest impact they've had that Les had on them personally. We're going to come back. We're going to add, Arthur and I are going to answer a few more questions, have some more folks answer questions. Then we're going to talk to the Florida boys directly right here on SGNP. I mean, you didn't have to wonder where Les Beasley stood. <laughs> He'd tell you. And uh, he didn't hold anything back. But uh, I guess 90% of, at least 90%, of what I ended up trying to do in gospel music came from Eldridge Fox and Les Beasley. They both thought on the same, same, let's keep our music pure, let's keep it straight, let's keep it, let's don't run down every rabbit trail. But that was his biggest impact was his honesty and his integrity. The biggest impact was that he was such a, a dear um, father-like figure, um, was always around me and my girls and always encouraging. And he would take both Amber and Autumn and, and pick them up and take them to get popcorn. And they will never forget that. Um, and one of the things I do remember is we were on another cruise. And, uh, of course, I was in one of those little small rooms, but less. Les and Francis had a suite, and they took all, uh, Amber down. Les took Amber down to their room. Um, when Amber get, got down there, she was she could hardly talk. But when she got in that room, Les said she was going, "What is I?" Because she knew his room was a lot better than our room. <laughs> uh, his knowledge of the history, uh, his love of the genre of music. Uh, I think again his his humor, uh, his his just his appreciation for people, and you know his commitment to the industry. Uh, you know, less up until a couple of years ago, he was still going out uh, with people singing on the road. He loved the music, and uh, it was his life, and 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 that speaks volumes. And that's something I'll always remember. He was definitely a pioneer in more ways than one. You know, Arthur, I don't know if this story is going to apply to you personally, but, you know, we've asked, we asked Ray Dean this, we ask uh, uh, all, all these guys this question, and it was something that they shared with Les and, that only them and Les knew about, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, Gene McDonald will tell you some funny stories coming up about it. Josh Garner will, and, and Tim, Tim will tell you some great stuff with the Florida boys later about it. But, uh, you know, Ke Kelly talks about when she was a little girl. You'll hear that in just a minute. Is there anything you can remember sharing with Les firsthand that made an impact on you that just uh, kept going? And maybe there's not. Maybe maybe there's not. But, you know, is there anything that you can recall right off the top of your head? Well, I remember when they retired – uh, I sat down and wrote each one of them a letter and uh, just uh, just handed it to them just to just because I I wanted them to realize the impact that they had on my life uh, growing up. Uh, uh, like I said, you know, they came into our home every Sunday. You know, we just welcomed them uh, and they became like family. You know, we just we knew them and and um, I, I shared that with the. Uh, with Les and, and and I remember he he came up after he read it and he was just uh, just so it was so grateful that 
that, uh, you know, that I took the time and I, I was just trying to be, you know, I just wanted to be uh, nice to them and tell them, you know, how much I appreciated everything that they did and, and, uh, the sacrifices that they went through. And that was what paved the way for me to be able to what I wanted to, you know, what I love to do. And, uh, that it just, they just meant a lot to me. All those guys did. Let me I'll tell you a personal story. And, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, I was a young radio DJ. I mean, I'm 48 now, so this was 20 years ago. And I said something on the air and probably shouldn't have said it. Um, there's probably things on the podcast I say that I probably shouldn't say, aren't there? If you don't know the truth about it. <laughs> well, we won't get into that. <laughs> we won't get into that today. But this is a true story. I was leading choir at a certain church, and uh, the Florida boys were going to sing there. So I get there, and I'm all excited because I'm the local DJ, and uh, – you know, the Florida boys are there, and I know the house is going to be full. And Les, in love, he said, Get Darren, good to see you again. I said, Yes, sir. He said, You got a minute? And I said, Yeah. And he took me to the back, and he said, uh, You know, he said, uh, Your stick is good. You do a good job, and you, you do a good, you do real good at what you do. But sometimes you don't need to say stuff if you don't know the whole truth about it. And you know, in society today, that probably applies more than ever with a lot oh, of different things. And, yeah. I, and I never forgot that. And uh, Les told me that in love and in wisdom, and not to scold me or correct me at all. No, not at all. Not at all. Just, he meant it, he meant it when, in love. He really meant it to yeah. help you. Yeah. 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 No doubt. And and I'll never forget that. And uh it's a time we had, and we shook hands, and we love the Florida boys. And one thing I always admire about him, and you know, it, it's um, is you know this, and I know this. Les never won an award for the greatest lead singer, okay? Mm. But I bet if they gave out awards for consistency, he would get one every year, because oh, absolutely, what you got with the Florida boys was consistency. With yeah. consistency, without a, without a shadow of a doubt. Let's take a break. Let's come back, and let's talk to some of the. Well, well, first, let's talk to Randy Shellnut, and Randy's going to tell us about his impact with the Dixie Echoes, with Les Beasley. Then we'll come back from that, and we'll talk to some of the Florida boys directly. This is Josh Singletary with Trivia Quartet, and you're listening to SGNP. <laughs> Over 
the hills and everywhere. No tenting on the mountain that Jesus Christ is going to live on the mountain. No tenting on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. No tenting on the mountain that Jesus Christ is going to live on the mountain. No on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere, go tending on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And welcome back to STNP, Darren Sutherland here with uh, one of Les's dearest friends, or and one of uh, his uh, friends. When we said we were putting this tribute show together, everybody said you got to talk to Randy Shelnut Senior with the Dixie Echoes. Him and Les were tight and good friends, and uh, Les more than likely had a great impact on his life. Randy, am I correct in saying all that good stuff? Oh, yeah. You know, that's probably an understatement. Uh, uh, the Florida Boys and the Dixie Echoes were always kind of like a big family, and uh, Mr. Whitfield, you know, started both of the groups. And, and, and we just were always like family, but um, – my dad and Les were very close, and and uh, actually, when we first moved to Pensacola, when Dad first came with the Dixie Echoes, um, we needed a place to live. And uh, <laughs> at that point in time, I was about seven years old, and my brother was four. And uh, well, there was my dad, my mom, and us two youngins, and we needed a place to live. And Les volunteered to be that place. He was a single young man at the time. And uh, if you can imagine a uh, a single man all of a sudden now has a family of four living with him, that's a, that's quite a quite a contrast in lifestyles. No doubt. But, uh, yeah, Les, uh, he, he was a loving guy. And, and I'll tell you, you know, uh, he took us in and, and was like family to us from that day on. And um, after Dad passed away, Les and I got to be involved in a couple of business ventures and uh, promotions, the Swanee River Jubilee, and, and we, we got real close through. And of course, we worked on our buses all the time together and things like that, and uh, just got to know each other so well. And uh, it was just one of, the, one of the greatest blessings in my life is to be able to have been associated with with Les and his family. Randy, so many folks that we've talked to, you can't not think about gospel music and you can't not think about Les Beasley and not think about the gospel singing Jubilee. You guys with the Dixie Echoes were there firsthand with the Florida Boys, probably as much as any artist there was on that show, be it the Goodmans, the Hensons, whoever. The Dixie Echoes seemed like they were always there. What were those days like working with Les Beasley and working the gospel singing Jubilee? Well, you know, looking back on it, it was a time that uh, was way more important than we thought it was at the time. But uh, it, it, it has, has always been amazing to me how the gospel music family, especially it seemed like in those days, was uh, was very close-knit. You know, all of the all of the people that you would work with, we just about work with everyone every week. Also on the on the road, and then every six or eight weeks we would get together and start film the jubilee. But uh, it it was a wonderful time. Looking back, I I miss it now more than I ever thought I would. You know, it, it's just a it was a time when we were all it was a camaraderie that that we kind of took for granted at the time. But now you can look back and see how special it really was. Just uh, every group, and especially us and the Florida boys, we were just, as I said, it was like having brothers and sisters. What was his biggest impact on you personally, Randy? Les was the kind that uh, I guess, you know, he's been known as one of the greatest if not the greatest quartet manager ever. And I, I never did see him really trying to 
uh, consciously portray himself as a leader, but some people are. And uh, Les showed me that, you know, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to consciously be in charge of everything to actually be in charge. <laughs> Many times it seemed like, you know, Les was, the Florida boys were actually a partnership, Daryl and Glenn and Les, and yeah. they were equal partners. But um, Les was the one that everybody came to for advice, for uh, for leadership. And, uh, you know, every, if an outsider would have thought that Les owned the group himself outright, but it was just uh, because of his leadership qualities in his in himself and uh, all the guys and everybody at the Jubilee, it, just about every aspect that, that uh, the Quartet Convention, everything that Les was involved in, he, he was a definite natural leader and people loved to loved his advice loved what his knowledge and how he he always tried to to study a subject and to to just like the bible says study to self, show yourself approved he he did and uh and uh Les knew what he was talking about when he opened his mouth you know, we've talked to, like I said, a lot of folks, and during this show, folks have heard us talk to a lot of folks. And when what they describe less, they use words like honesty, integrity, uh, didn't worry about ego, didn't care about cliques, would break them up in a heartbeat if he, if he saw the need to. Marine, stern, discipl- disciplinarian. What's one of those adjectives you could use to describe Les Beasley? <laughs> Well, I'm going to go into a whole different ball field. Go ahead. Les was Les was one of the biggest hearted people that I believe I've ever known, and with a with a kind of a crusty exterior. A lot of people never saw that, but I did. I saw it many times. Les had a, had a heart of gold, and uh, and I think really when it all boiled down to and said and done, that's what he'll be known for. Les would help you when. He didn't have to, and Les would uh, would try to guide you or or encourage you when he didn't have to, and uh, I think that's what Les will truly be known for, and I know he is with his family and and uh, his friends. Randy, something that you and Les shared personally that uh, the world don't know about, but any time you and Les maybe got around each other. It may come up. Could have been something funny that happened between the two of you. A lesson you learned as a young boy through Les. A lesson you learned as a quartet man or in business together. What's something you'd like to share about him that the world don't know that's uh, something that will always stick with you? Well, I guess, you know, you mentioned a while ago integrity, and and that that was one of the things that Les just, if he told you something, if he told you he was going to do something, if he told you that he would uh, try to do something, it would be done to the best, to the to the last degree of Les's ability. He was going to keep his word, and uh, I've tried to do that. I've tried to be a person that, if I tell you something, if I tell you that I'm going to do something, I'll do it, whether or not it benefits me or or uh, doesn't benefit me, and, and that's the way Les was. If he told you he would do something, then whether or not he uh, gained or lost from it, he would still do it. He would still make sure that he did what he said. And, uh, you know, he it's just like with the quartet. If, they, uh, if their bus was broke down, if they had a problem or something to make or date, he would make that date whether or not it meant losing money to to make that day, and uh, because he had made a commitment to whoever was was promoting that day or the church or whatever, because Les gave him his word he would be there, and if humanly possible, he would be there. Randy, anything I hadn't asked you about Les that you want to add? I know uh, he was a heck of a comedian in his own right. Loved to laugh. Loved to cut up. Loved business, created everything from the Dove Awards, was on the 
NQ Seaboard, Gospel Singing Jubilee, countless other concerts and countless other things. Anything that you want to add that maybe I hadn't asked you about, Les? No, I think the only thing that I could add to that would be uh, Les will be remembered as a, you know, as a kind and a and a, a friend that's um, going to be missed by so many. And uh, me being one of them that will miss him dearly, already do. But uh, Les will probably be remembered for being such a kind and a and a fellow that showed the old fashioned integrity that this world needs. Is someone you love playing a dangerous game of Russian roulette? Hey, this is Darren, and I'm going to tell you some personal information. I've got dear friends who are addicted to methamphetamines. I've got family members who overdosed from heroin and passed away. I've got relatives who suffer alcohol addiction and are alcoholics. You've heard from Russ Taft talk about his his problem with alcoholism. Addiction is a scary thing. In anywhere in the country you think about it, addiction's a big problem. Right now, the Addiction Hotline wants to help you and your family. And with the new Federal Family Medical Leave Act, you can get the help you deserve. Call the Addiction Hotline today, 1-800-980-1761, 1-800-980-1761, and talk to them about the help you, your friends, or your family may need. Heck, over 43,000 people die every year from drug overdose. 88,000 people die every year from alcohol abuse. 1-800-980-1761. 1-800-980-1761. If Russ Taft can stand on stage and then later admit, hey, I've got a problem with alcoholism, you can too. Get the help you deserve, and I promise you, your heart will be so much happier for it, not to mention your family and friends. Karen Peck Gooch with Karen Peck in the River, and you're listening to the best in gospel music right here on SGNT. Sad. His back was laid in the heavy, his strength was almost gone, but he shouted as he journeyed, deliverance will come. Shouted hallelujah, deliverance has come. And on the line with us today is we talk to the Florida boys individually and uh we got a few today on this les beasley tribute here is uh if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong josh you're not only one of the the former tenor singer with the florida boys but you're a relative of les's am i correct and did i miss something did i make that up did i think of that you you pulled that out of thin air man i pulled it so you're not so you're not no, oh, no, okay. no, no relation. No relation. For some reason, I was thinking that. 
And I guess it's because I, I kid my historian Jeff Turner about everybody being related one way or another in this gospel music world. So uh, Josh Gardner on the line with us up in North Carolina. He's the lead singer now for the Dixie Melody Boys, but uh, he trained under the great Les, ben, uh, Les, Les Beasley. And uh, Josh, just your reflections as uh, as one of the greats passed away Sunday. Saturday, yeah, it, Saturday it, uh... we, we learned Sunday, excuse me. Right. Yeah, it uh I got the call Saturday night and it was one of those things that uh I was kind of just waiting for it. Yeah. Um I hate to say that, but that's the reality, you know. Les was 90 years old and Les was like family to me, my goodness. Uh he was like a second dad because when I joined the group, I was only 19 years old and he was already in his 70s, uh around 75, I guess. But uh, Les and my grandfather were the same age. They were six months apart. My grandfather was uh, six months older. And sadly, they both suffered from the same condition there at the end of their life. And so I could I could relate, you know, a whole lot to the Beasley family and the situation they were going through because I'd already been through it with my grandfather, and he had passed just a couple months ago. So two of the greatest men I've ever known in my life, you know, suffering the same situation passing relatively close so it's been a tough year it really has and uh but but brother Les, i mean my goodness when you talk about titans in the industry of gospel music i don't know if you get any bigger or any better than les beasley he did it all he saw it all uh and twice on sunday you know yeah um what a man he i, I said on uh I don't know if you remember the Grand Ole Gospel reunion that Charlie Waller would host every yeah, year. Yeah, sure do. Uh, he, would, he would always pay tribute to an individual and, and do like the old This Is Your Life program that folks will remember from television. And uh, the year he did a uh, tribute to Les, I said, and, and you can see it on the video, I said, you know, I hope to be half the man that he is. And I mean that uh, because he was a man and a half for sure. Uh, served his country, served his family, and definitely served his Lord through gospel music. Josh, you know, you rode the bus with him every day when you were 19 years old. You're sitting there with him. You see how he acts, not only on stage and the impact he has in front of crowds, the impacts behind the table, the impacts that he has when you're sitting in uh, in Denny's or, or wherever you're eating lunch or breakfast and people out of nowhere come up and say, Hey, are you that guy? Are you that person? Or what was Les's reaction to to those folks that remembered him from their youth, but may have not have seen him in a long time because they might not have been your average gospel music fans, but they remember him from a childhood or from a right. when they were younger, growing up. What what was what was yeah. what was some of those moments like? Well, and, and that's the thing because. Les was so completely recognizable from being on television every Sunday morning for 30-plus years with the Gospel Singing Jubilee. He hosted and produced that show. So millions upon millions of people saw him every single week on television. And, you know, Les, he he went whiteheaded pretty early on in life, uh, I think in his 30s, actually. So he always had that distinguished uh, silver hair. And, you know, he just had a look about him that was instantly recognizable. And the thing about Les, that uh, he was so relatable because he didn't have necessarily a a performer switch. You know how a lot of us, uh, you know, we have an on mode. Mm -hmm. We turn on when we go on stage. And then when we get off stage, get on the bus, we shut down completely. And it's almost like two, you know, almost like a Jekyll and Hyde type thing. Les was always consistent to where he didn't have to turn on. He was just less uh, day and night on stage and off you, what you saw was what you get. And everybody got one of the, the most personable, uh, I mean, and less was a cut up, believe me, uh, less love to laugh. He had one of the most recognizable laughs you'll ever hear in your life. And every time he would get really tickled, he'd start to tear up. And he, you, if he was wiping his eyes, you knew he was having a good time because he was just enjoying life. And uh, so it, it didn't matter if we were in a restaurant, if we were in a Walmart, a truck stop, whatever. When somebody would recognize Les Beasley, he'd always flash that smile, shake their hand, greet the person, and make them feel like an old friend because that's just that's who he was. 
You know, we know he had an impact on Southern gospel music, but bigger than that, he had a big impact on Christian music as a whole yeah. because Christian music as we know it today wouldn't be what it was today without less. You know, he he invented the Dove Awards. A lot of people don't realize this. Mm -hmm. What would you say to you personally is Les's biggest contribution overall to the music world? That's so tough because there were so many things that he was involved in. You know, the formation of the Gospel Music Association. He was the president of the National Quartet Convention for 40-plus years. Um, just everything that he touched turned to gold, it seemed like. And I don't you, – you can't discount – the overall success of the Florida Boys Quartet, when you think about it, you know, the, the group officially started in 1947. We retired in 2007. That's 60 years of consistency each and every year on the road, and that was due to Les's leadership and his management of the group. But I think when the, the final chapter is written, to me, this is my opinion, I think Les's greatest contribution to all of music was the Gospel Singing Jubilee, hosting that television show each and every week for 30-some years to be on national television, different parts of the world even, um, introduced uh, countless groups to our field. You know, you wouldn't know the Inspirations. You wouldn't know the Hensons. You wouldn't be familiar with the Goodmans if it weren't for the Gospel Singing Jubilee, and Les was the driving force behind that show for, for each and every time, you know, for all those years. No doubt, no doubt. Last question I'll ask you, and, and, and we could talk forever. We've got some more guys coming on. And, Josh, again, thank you for your time, and thank you for what you sure. do in gospel music. But give give our listeners something personal that you and Les shared. For instance, something you guys talked about that was something Les always brought up to you, even after you left the Florida Boys and went your own way and went with another group but something that you and Les always had something in common that you would talk about. What, what, what was that? If there's anything. I, I will share something with you. This, this was actually, um, and, and it's tough for me to even go back. I was thinking about it just yesterday and just broke down crying. Uh, when I think about just how much it meant to me, um, I got married in 2005 and my wife, had already started a master's program at a university up here in Tennessee uh, while well, I was, of course, living in Pensacola, Florida. And, you know, when a couple gets married, the natural thing to do is move in together. But because of our situation, that wasn't going to be a reality at the time. So, and a lot of people don't know this, but the first two years of our marriage, I lived in Pensacola. My wife, she was finishing her degree here in Tennessee, and, and it was tough. It really was. Yeah. I and I went to Les um, probably six months after we got married. I went to Les's office one day, and I was ready to quit. I, I, I'd, I'd got to the point where I said, this is not working. Uh, you know, we, there's no way we can start a life together living separately like this. I've got to move to Tennessee if, you know, we're going to make this work. And I went to Les's office and, and almost immediately before I could say a word, you know, I started breaking down a little bit and, and, um, I told him, I said, I'm, I'm going to have to quit the group. I've got to, I've got to fix this. I've got to do something different. And Les Beasley has a bit of a reputation for having thick skin being a little tough, you know, old military guy, whatever. But uh, he had a heart of gold, and he loved people. He really, truly loved people and had a genuine concern for folks. And he sat there and cried with me for probably 30 minutes. And we talked about <clears throat> different options, how we might be able to make it work, how, um, you know, how he could help me out maybe with some travel expense, driving back and forth to Tennessee and uh, and, and, you know, basically he said, I don't want you to quit. I'm not ready for you to leave. And he didn't, you know, some people might look at that and say, well, that that's kind of selfish, but it wasn't really. Um, he wanted the best of, of all worlds for me. And we did make it work. We figured out, you know, some ways to make it work to where I could get up there more often. And uh, we weren't working as much. Uh, there the last couple of years, we still worked very consistently, but uh, not the, the heavy schedule that they did. And 
And, you know, I, I know that a little part of that was to help me out. And that meant the world to me that he would be that concerned, uh, for our marriage to work, that he would make a little sacrifice on the group's end. And, uh, that just, people will never know, uh, the impact that had on my life. It saved my marriage, uh, you know, uh, I'll never, I'll never be able to repay him or thank him enough for that that simple act, and uh, that that's something that's going to stay with me forever. Josh, thank you so much for taking your time this afternoon, and I know you could sit here literally and talk for hours as we all could about the great Les Beasley. And uh, I've said this before in the show, and I'll say it again: if they were to build a Mount Rushmore for gospel music icons, Les certainly would be one of the four up there. Don't you agree? He'd be. He'd be the first, in my opinion. Thank you, my friend. Darren Sutherland back with you on SGNP on the line with us on this great tribute to the icon of gospel music, Les Beasley, is uh, the bass singer himself with the Florida Boys and uh, probably Les's favorite bass singer and favorite bus driver, Gene McDonald. Gene, how you doing, my friend? No, I'm just kidding. Hey, how are you? Do it, doing well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm I was his favorite bus, bus driver. <laughs> you was his favorite bus driver? <laughs> I was his favorite bus driver. I kept him alive. There you go. You know what, Gene? Tell us, tell us what it was like as a young man working for, for Les Beasley. You had to learn a lot. You know, it was, uh, you know, I was a punk kid. Uh, I, was in my, I was 33 when I joined the group. But I hadn't grown up yet, uh, you know, as far as that goes. And, uh, you know, it was it was a tough love, tough, uh, you know, you're going to do what I say type thing. And then there was no problem with that because that was that was my, my uh, I guess that's just the way I was. I was more of a servant than I was anything. And we, we had a good time. I can only remember two, two tests. In ten years, that uh, you know, that really caused any problems. But less, you know, I mean, me and him worked on buses together, we had generators, whatever, whatever was tore up. Me and him worked on, and if it was sound equipment, whatever Glenn was working on, I was trying to trying to mess up, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, less, less was just fun. Uh, he enjoyed laughing, and if he could laugh at my expense, he was just just triple happy so that's the reason why he called me gawky because i i tripped all the time gene um you know you said you grew up under less 10 years joined him when he was 33 what's the biggest impact no doubt less was a marine so he was no doubt stern from everything everybody's ever told us about him in doing these interviews they've mentioned two words honesty and integrity and everything he's done. You and I talked about before we got on the air a conversation we had with Les. That, that, Are that, you there? That, that, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you, you said, we'll start back over. Here we go. That's the great thing about podcasts. is different from radio. We can always start back over. You know, right. you, when you were, th- you, you said you joined the group when you were 33 years old. You were there for 10 years. You grew up under Les, so to speak. You know, he was a Marine. He was stern. Everybody we've interviewed has said his honesty and his integrity was beyond question. You always knew where you stood with Les. What was his biggest impact on Gene McDonald's personal life? You know, I think just uh, at that time, uh, there was some, some uh, I really needed somebody that was a cheerleader. Uh, but not a, uh, not one, one holding the bottle, you know, just, I didn't need a pacifier. I needed somebody to, to help me if I asked for help, but, but to say, you can do it. And, uh, Les, Les was a great guy to, uh, he, he didn't lie to you if, if, if he had something to tell you. And if you asked him what what he thought, you better not want what he thought if you didn't want it. Because <laughs> he would tell you. He would tell you the facts, whether you liked it or not, or whether he liked it or not. And uh, and I like that about him. 
you know, most of, most of everything the Florida Boys showed me was off stage uh, and the integrity that they had off stage and the compassion that they had for their wives and their family off stage. And uh, so it taught me to be a better man off stage. Uh, me and Les had a wonderful time on stage. We were we were on the road, you know, 250, 300 days a year. And so, you know, that was just fantastic for me. Uh, that was, I enjoyed it. And, and I loved, loved the camaraderie, uh, loved picking on him, and he loved picking on me. So, you know. Gene, what is uh, what is something that you and Les shared that even still to this day, if you would walk up to Les, Les would say to you that was almost like code or an inside joke between you two that he said, "Boy, I got you." Or, you know, what what was something y'all could talk about that the world don't know about that you you would like for them to know about? How about that, Gene? Well, we were we I was uh, we were coming back from California. And we had put a new uh, hydraulic pump on the bus, and it was not totally square. And so we bought a bunch of belts on the way to California, and we slung almost every one of them <laughs> uh, on the way back. We were in Somerville. We were going to Somerville, Texas, or Rock Springs, Texas, or somewhere. Uh, just outside of Milano, Texas, and uh, we come around this corner, and we was, we was probably about two hours away from it, three hours, and I watched that belt come out from behind that bus, and I just, I was so mad, I just hit the brakes and pulled over the shoulder. That was the only belt we had, mm -hmm. and uh, so I started walking back towards that bus, about towards that belt, and I finally got the belt. And I run across the interstate to get on my side of the road, and Les says, hey, you want to ride? And he had talked some old man from wherever we were to drive him down there and make fun of me because I walked all the way down there. <laughs> and uh, so, so I got in the truck, and I said, I do not know how you can find more rides. I can't find a ride if my, my life depended on it. And you can walk. You could sneeze and somebody say, can I help you? So. You know, Gene, you've worked with Bill Gaither. You've worked with great gospel singers all across the world. Outside looking in, what does all these folks ask you about Les Beasley that I hadn't asked you? Wow, that's a pretty good question. Uh, what was, you know, just uh, I would say – uh, what was he like? You know, what was he really like? Uh, you know, he was he was a stern, stern man, but he he was soft hearted, and uh, he was uh, serious, but he loved to play. And when it was time to play, he loved to play. And when it was time to be serious, he would did not want any playing. Uh, me and Josh were talking. Uh, we've seen him stop in the middle of the concert and ask if there was a problem on stage, you know, much less if there was a problem out in the audience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so less, less was no nonsense, uh, but he loved having fun when he was having fun and he loved doing what he did. Uh, he was definitely a lover of gospel music and one of the biggest promoters of gospel music that I know. And, uh, he just loves people. He loves people. So anything I hadn't asked you, know, you? You want to add about Les anything at all? I'll tell you one more story. We was we was in uh, Texas. We sung Floyd Moore sung more in Texas than anybody that wasn't from Texas. Uh, and we sung somewhere north of north of Fort Worth, and uh, we had a something go wrong with the bus, and I had the part. And the guy would not let us use, it was after 3 o'clock on Saturday, and it wouldn't take me but about 45 minutes. Me and Les primarily worked on the bus as much as anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I had all the tools, and I said, sir, I could, I, it won't take me but 45 minutes if I could just rent your, your bay. No, you're not going to do it. And uh, 
So Les realized that the guy was, was in the Marines. And uh, he, he said, you're not going to let a Marine miss his date, are you? And that changed the whole attitude. The old boy said a few things that that uh, that I'm gonna, you're going to pay me back for this. But uh, but he sure did. We he let us work on the bus in his bay and told us to get out and never come back. <laughs> and so, <laughs> had, so <laughs> had, a, had a wave of words, I guess. Yes, 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 yes. He was he was extremely joyous. I will say that. Well, Gene. So. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And uh, real quick, tell us what tell everybody what's going on in Gene McDonald's world these days. Man, just uh, we're about to do six more, seven more uh, Christmas shows, and then uh, I'm singing in uh, Missouri in January. We're trying to book 2019. Uh, GeneMcDonaldMusic.com. If you want to, if you would like for me to come sing at your church or or uh, anything, I would love to do it. All righty, my friend. But, uh, just trying to stay busy. Well, th- trying to keep keep the going. Keep 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 the keep the bills paid and keep having fun singing for Jesus. What else can you do? You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Buddy, it's always good to talk to you. We'll touch base later, and uh, you have a great holiday. And thanks for sharing with us about the great Les Beasley. All righty. Thank you, sir. Thank right. you. We'll talk have to you soon. Bye bye. SGNP, and we're talking to the Florida boys this afternoon. And uh, once you're a Florida boy. As Josh Garner said earlier, you're always a Florida boy. And uh, yeah. we've got Tim Lovelace, a great friend of the show, on with us. Tim, um, I know when you got the call Saturday or Sunday or whenever you got the call, we we knew it was coming. Les, 90 years old, lived a great life. But uh, right. what was your immediate thoughts and reactions? Well, it, it, you know um, – I found out uh, Saturday night um, after it happened and got a text. And and truthfully, um, although we knew it was coming, uh, it's been one of the hardest few days um, because Les was one of those. It was more than a job. I was there almost a decade with him, uh, over nine years. But I knew him a lot longer before that. And... uh, and and Les was one of those almost every morning. If we went out and did twenty twenty day concert, or you know, if the Florida boys went out for thirty days, they didn't take a day off. It'd be thirty two or thirty three concerts in thirty days. If we were out twenty one days, we'd probably do twenty three concerts. They they just you know they work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday every night. We went out west or Canada, and almost every morning Les and I'd have breakfast and. I picked his brain for almost 10 years. And so he was like a mentor. Um, he was, uh, just, he was so intelligent and, uh, knew gospel music so well, but, he, but he, you know, so he, it was more than just a boss or a lead singer, but he was, he, he was a lot of things in my life. So it's, it's been a, it's been a tough week, and we've just been encouraging everybody to, to pray and continue to pray for the Beasley family. Gene McDonald said to me earlier when we talked to him that without Les, he may not have grown up. Okay, he helped yeah. he helped him grow up. He said, "I joined him when I was thirty three, and he helped me grow up the ten years I was with him." What would you say Les helped Tim with the most? during your time with him well probably from well, that would probably be several things he, he did you know being a, a former tank commander and uh a, and a marine he uh, he said i spent half my life making baby boys grow up <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh th- there was a, a, lot, a lot of truth to that he he said he believed that every uh that we should have required military you know, because most baby boys go from high school and their mama and everybody tell them how wonderful they are. And then they go into life and they're feeling like the whole world loves them. And the fact of the matter is, you're just another guy that needs to become a man. And so he, he did, uh, he didn't sugarcoat things. Um, he would, he would, uh, uh, but, but business wise, when I've had people say, you know, uh, 
how do you go certain places or how do you do this or how, how did you get into this this situation you know my mind always always go, goes to less because he was he he thought out of the box um but 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 more than that and and he did help me grow up a lot although i'm, I'm still 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 a, a professional goofball <laughs> but but um but you know, he, he, he had common sense to go with it. Um, and Darren, I, you know, uh, it, it, he could, he could give you so much wisdom and, and, and a short answer or, or statement. I remember one day he came into me and uh, we were on the bus and he said, um, I had a love lace, you know, he'd kind of talk that little kind of gruff voice. And yet he was a big old baby at heart. And he said, love lace. He said, I got a question for you. And of course it was a rhetorical question. And he said, um, they want me to speak. I think it was either GMA or, or, or something in Nashville. He said they want me to speak to a lot of managers of, of groups on how to to run a group uh, for as many years as I have with the Florida boys to, to keep them on the road financially. And then he asked me this rhetorical question. He said, so let me ask you this. How am I supposed to speak for an hour on how you manage and keep a group on the road financially? when all I have to say is don't spend more than you make. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he had su such wisdom to that. So Les just, uh, he influenced my life in, in just layers of, of ways. Tim, I've asked, I've asked others this question, and I'll ask you this question, and others have, have mentioned this to me, and you, you've, you know, you've alluded to it so far in what we've said. But... Ed Harper said to me yesterday, Maurice Templeton said to me yesterday, Josh said to me, and everybody, Kelly has said to me yesterday in, in, in the interviews that we've done, that honesty and integrity were the hallmarks of Les Beasley. He was going to tell you something. You said he didn't sugarcoat anything. Right. Can you tell me of a situation where at the time – Les didn't maybe sugarcoat something to you or told you the gun barrel straight and you didn't like it, but you look later on in life and you say that may have been one of the best things he's ever said or, or, or done for me. Well, you know, he, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a huge, huge, huge question really, uh, Darren. He, he, um, uh, uh so many different things, such as, you know, he would say to really be out here on the road, you need to make sure that, that God has called you to it. He, um, he was not one for egos. He, uh, uh, which I've never had a problem with that. Thank the Lord. I don't think anybody in gospel music, when the Lord walked all the way to Calvary, should be walking around thinking that they're special, Yeah, you know? Yeah. But he, he, he also, uh, uh, I've, my father raised me to, to tell the truth mm -hmm. and less and I would talk about the truth because he, if he saw of anyone in business, anyone at a record company, anyone would lie to him. He could, he could just tell you, well, probably say now, Tam, don't do business with that person over there because they're a liar until that changes. I'm not doing business with them. And if you can, <laughs> he, in other words, it was not sugarcoating. It's like that person has lied to us, and boom, that's why I'm changing from this company to this company, or I'm going to have it manufactured over here. If you can't tell me the truth, I don't need to do business with you. And some people would say, well, that's pretty strong. Well, you know, you, you, how the world can you do with business with somebody you don't trust? And so, uh, but at the same time, less a lot of people didn't know that the really soft tender side because he was that Marine, but I've seen him leave, leave the room, like, like a, the cleanup room that you, you know, a group checks in and everyone kind of take turns during the day and shower and one room clean up and whatever. I've seen it be a sad movie on and Daryl or Glenn or somebody be watching an old movie and be old yeller or something some tender hearted old movie and I've seen Les have to get up and grab his computer and you know, I need to go out there to the bus and do so and so he would 
leave because he was about to to start crying in front of everybody because he was he was so tender hearted and loved his family so much and and uh, Clark and and he just really he was the one when when I went into church service because I I've always loved babies and I'd go in and I'd I'd say Les have you seen that that, that little you'd be a little six month old and Somebody be carrying around a little baby, just cute as could be, and he'd say, "Oh, I've already, I've, I've been holding a little Bubba this morning, or whatever his name would be." He was the one walking around a lot of times carrying that little baby, and I've seen a lot of times we'd get up to sing on Sunday morning or Sunday night somewhere, and I'd see a, he'd have a little bit of baby drool over on, on his coat because he was always a a papa at heart and tender hearted, and a lot of people d- didn't know that side to him, but he. He really cared for people and and would would give and financially help uh, people that were in trouble. That and but he would never make a show of it. Someone would come to me and say, "Boy, uh, the only way I got through that, or you know, the way we got through that funeral, that Les slipped me a pretty large check or whatever." Wow! And he was he was always giving, but not making a show out of it, you know. And uh, so he was very tender hearted. And, 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 you know, Darren, if I could say something else, too. I was talking to someone in the industry uh, uh, yesterday about Les. And Les, I saw so many times because he loved gospel music. He loved the message. You know, Darren, he it was never about putting the Florida boys always first. It was about the industry. He truly believed that if you, with the gospel jubilee, with with things that he did with, uh, uh, with, uh, Dove Awards. And, you know, he would, of course, you know, he came with a lot of the ideas for the, for the original Dove. And, you know, he was all, he, he was there for, for all of that to help gospel music. And his focus was not let Les be number one, let Florida boys be number one. Uh, his focus was, let gospel music reach the most people it can as, as possible. And, and, and when I look around a lot today, me and this industry person was talking yesterday, it's like a lot of people care about gospel, but it's kind of, they still want their own agenda to be first. And they kind of want to make sure they're number one, less believed in the good of all of gospel. And that to me was just a, uh, uh, a great character uh, trait that, that, that he had. He, he he always looked at the big picture, saw the young group, saw the young talents, wanted to help them out, call and do things a lot of times that they didn't even know about to help the records be played. And and uh, he had a huge heart that a, a lot of people never knew about uh, as far as he would do things behind the scene and 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 do it do it do it quietly. Tim, last question. I know you're busy, and, and you and I could talk about lists just like anybody we've talked to. We could talk about lists for two hours apiece and still not get it all out. No. But, but give me something personal that you and Les probably talked about or discussed or when y'all saw each other even after you left the Florida boys, when y'all would see each other, that would always come up that y'all personally shared together, something a personal moment that uh, you and Les maybe laughed about together, you had something you kidded about, or a story that just that just defies time that uh, is a Les Beasley memory for Tim? Well, um, don't, don't make me start crying here, there. But uh, when Les hired me, Florida Boys, uh, Daryl had been sick for a while, and I would go off. I would play in a recording studio in Mobile, and he would call me up and say, Daryl is sick, and he would fly me somewhere, or I would meet him on the bus somewhere, and I'd play for a couple weeks until Daryl got better and come back. And then and maybe six months later, that would happen again. And when I actually started with him full-time, then I went, like I said, a little nine years or whatever, nine nine going on 10 um 
nonstop. But those early transition periods before I was with him all that time, um, he he decided to to keep me on, and he didn't have to, you know, and and uh, he uh, he said I'll put you on bass. And then Clark came. He's like, can you play guitar? And I'm like, well, I guess a little bit. And then he said, won't you bring a banjo? And and he just uh, he he saw how much I, I I love you know gospel music. And just love picking and and so. He didn't have to hire me, and uh, because really I was a piano player, and a lot of people think of me as picking, but that was less creating a job for me. And uh, he would say, "Well, don't you bring a harmonica?" Point is, he didn't have to hire me; they, they didn't have to have me. And he started using me in comedy and doing different things, and he just um, we just became really close friends. Well, then when you fast forward. Um, when my wife was singing in a group, uh, Royal Airs, and they were on the cruise ship, Les, Les hardly pulled anybody up on stage to sing with Florida Boys unless, you know, they were like an old friend or somebody who'd sung for years. But he loved Mary Alice's voice, and for some reason he just really liked her, and he called her up to sing the solo, and she and I became friends, and... Uh, Five years later, we got married. So to bring it full circle, every time I'd see Les after we married and had our daughter, Gabrielle, and she loved Les. She called him Papa Les. She'd run. She's two or three or four and jump up in his arms. And uh, she is 15 now, but she loves Papa Les and Mimo. Uh, this is why Francis. But the point of it is, I know that I wouldn't be married to Mary Alice. I wouldn't have my family. I wouldn't have my career. I wouldn't have my sweet baby girl. Uh, it had been for Les Beasley. And so that is something I told Mary Alice as soon as I heard the news the other night. I said, well, I don't have to wonder, did we ever thank him for that? Because... Every time we'd see him, we'd say, Les, you know, he'd, he'd say, yeah, I know. I'd say, I've got my family because of your heart. And I thanked him uh, a lot of times. And, uh, and Tim, every time you come on, my friend, you're supposed to be the comedian. You make me cry. <laughs> but well, you know what? I appreciate your heart. I appreciate what you said about Les. I know our listeners appreciate what you say about Les. And most importantly, we appreciate what you stand for personally, my friend, and uh, for sharing with us the impact the great Les Beasley has made uh, on your life and how uh, he's impacted millions for the cause of Christ. Yes. And uh, That's right. It, that's and I just, I just want to say, uh, Darren, I, I want to encourage you again, uh, uh, everyone to to pray for the Beasley family. Clark, he's uh, he's he's such a good friend and such a a good a good man. All all of the family, uh, Francis, uh, uh, Les, and Francis. Uh, I don't know a couple who've been any closer. And for this transition for them and for the weeks and months and uh, ahead, just uh, if they'll, if they'll all pray for pray for the Beasley family. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk soon, and we'll talk. And 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 here here's what I'll say. Um, you know, a lot of times when folks pass away, we think about the sad times. But the assurance me and you have right now is we know without a mm-hmm. doubt where Les is at. And uh, yes, Les Les is so much better off than the rest of us even could be. Selfishly, we you. you're going to miss him, but. Uh, the impact he had is golden. Go ahead. And you know, Darren, uh, maybe uh, some other time. Let's 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 pick out five or ten minutes some other time, and uh, and I'll tell you some stories that'll 
They'll crack crack you and I both up. I'll tell you, <laughs> tell you some l- l- less stories because he he was he was one he was one funny man. That's what everybody keeps telling us. That's what everybody is saying. We're gonna have to do that. We're going okay, to have then. to do that. I promise you, Tim. We'll get with you, and and we'll do that real soon. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great, there. Thank you, Tim. Love you, buddy. Love you, man. Thank you for your time. Great information there from Randy Shelnut with the Dixie Echoes. Josh Garner, who's now with lead singer with the Dixie Melody Boys, former tenor with the Florida Boys. Gene McDonald, bass singer who took over from Buddy Lyles with the Florida Boys back in the day and uh, sang with them for 10 years. Um, and then Tim Lovelace, one of the show's dear friends, and talked about the impact. Here's what sticks out with those three interviews from those Florida boys to me, Arthur, and you can comment on this. Number one, um, Josh talked about the compassion Les had, and even though he was the stern Marine, he would sit there and cry with you and in love with you. Gene, yeah. Gene McDonald mentioned that he was a 33-year-old boy and used that word in the interview, and Les helped him grow up. In, in with for his 10 years that they were there and tim said and i quote he didn't need me but he found a place for me and by finding a place for me i'm where i'm at today those yep. are those are three selfless acts that yep. that that we don't hear from a lot and you know the thing i love that that Tim said to us is he didn't have an ego. Josh talked about when they would go and be sitting in a Denny's in St. Louis, Missouri, or wherever. I'm just making up a town. He didn't mention a town. But they could be sitting there, and people that hadn't watched gospel music in 20 years would walk up to their table and say, hey, aren't you the guy that used to come on my TV on Sunday morning? And they would assume he was dead because he had white hair from such an early age when he was in his early 30s. And he was on yeah. TV for 30 years. So they assumed yeah. he was 50 or 60 when he was doing the show, when in all actuality <laughs> he was my age or your age or even younger. And uh, Maurice talked about how he was able to, earlier in the show, talked about how he was able to transpire over time and build bridges and knock down walls and knock down egos and knock down cliques and just yeah. be an icon in the industry. But yet he was a funny guy. He loved to cut up. He loved to laugh. It was such a good thing. We're going to close the show. And I know when we marketed the show and when we put the show out, we said we were going to have an interview with your good friend, Glenn Allred, um, Les's partner. Yeah. Les's partner. Yeah. Now, before you and I started today, we had every intentions of calling Glenn. But you made contact with Glenn this morning. Glenn had agreed to be on. But during this time, well, I'll just let you tell the story, and you you, you leave it how you want it, and uh, we'll go from there. Fair enough? Yeah, I, I called Glenn and just, to, uh, you know, just talked to him and, and – you know, kind of told him what we were, what we were wanting to do. And, and he was, he, he wanted to be a part of it so much. And he was so grateful that we uh, would include him in that. And then when I called him this morning uh, before the program, um, you know, it, it, it's just, he was uh, too, I think he was just too emotional. And um, uh, he, he just didn't feel like that, that he was up for it today. And I told him I totally understood. And, you know, we just talked and, you know, and, and just he shared with me some great stories. And, and uh, we just had a, just a special time. And uh, but we're going to have uh, we're going to have Glenn on uh, real soon. And, I, I, you know, Glenn is just man, just a, he's another great guy. And, and uh, um, he, he got some just great stories about Les and, and uh, we want him to share that, want him to have that time. But we wanted to be. Uh, sensitive to, uh, uh, you know, they they sung together for over fifty years. I mean, they were, they were family. They were yeah, brothers, absolutely. They yeah. tra- they probably yeah. traveled ten million miles in a bus together. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and um, he he wanted to be a part of this, but he just felt like he was just it was just too an emotional time for him. And so we want to give him time and 
to deal with that and and uh, but we want him to be a part of this so we, hopefully in the in the near future we're going to have him on can you share one of those quick funny stories that uh, he shared with you <laughs> well there, lord there's so many <laughs> it was great <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he he was just talking about you know how they how they got uh, started with the uh, you know with the gospel singing jubilee and and you know how they uh, and one of the things that really stuck out to me about Les is even when he got to the point to where you know he he wasn't he realized at, at one point and and like you said you know he wasn't just a phenomenal singer but buddy he could just I mean he had, he could lay that part in there and man. Uh, you know, to be spokesman and lead singer uh, for the for the group for so many years. And when he got to the point to where, you know, he felt like that he he wasn't doing uh, a, a good job uh, singing, uh, you know, when he brought Josh on to sing lead and and, you know, less he just stood back and and let those guys shine. And and boy, just never it was never an ego thing for him. And uh, that that really stuck out to me, and and I hope at some point when I get to that point, you know, that I can have the same dignity that he showed, um, and it, it that really impacted me. I remember when I interviewed him on the radio, I asked him about that, and I said, "You've brought a lead singer on. Why don't Les retire?" And he says, "I can't." And he, I said, mm-hmm. "Why is that?" And he said, "Not not being." He, w- he wasn't bragging, but he said, the people won't let me. When they mm-hmm. when they hear the Florida boys, they mm-hmm. want to see Les Beasley. And, yeah. you know, I thought about that, and I thought about my own life, and I thought about brands, and I thought about the advertising game and how certain things, you know, l- l- let me just, this is going to sound kind of funny, okay? But when you think about Pete Rose, what do you think about baseball? Okay. Mm-hmm. When you think about Joe Montana, you think about football. Mm-hmm. When you think about mm-hmm. Les Beasley, you think about gospel music and the Florida Boys. Yep. And yep. 30 years on a TV show, unheard of. He was Bill Gaither before Bill Gaither was Bill Gaither. Yeah. More impact with the Gospel Music Association, then we'll ever know. There would be no Michael W. Smith. There would be no Amy Grant. There would be no David Crowder. There would be no Third Day. There would be no Kirk Franklin. There would be no Donnie McClurkin. There would be no uh, Switchfoot. There would be no cathedrals all joining together to celebrate Jesus without Les Beasley. Yeah. He, he was a quartet man, first of all, but he said he we all need to get at the same table, and uh, that's something something else, something else. Don't yes. you agree? Yeah. Great legacy. Great, Great legacy. legacy. Arthur, it's been kind of a fun show, a funny show, yet a sad show, but I hope Clark and the family see this as a tribute show and uh, our little piece of the pie that we're uh, – we're going to uh, send out, and it's probably our longest show that we'll ever do. But uh, you know what, Arthur? It's worth it. It's worth Absolutely. it to pay tribute. Absolutely. And we couldn't put enough time in. And for those that listen just to hear Glenn, um, we apologize. But you know what? We need to respect Glenn's privacy at this time. And he's going through the loss of a brother. He's going through the loss yeah. of a brother and a dear friend and a family member. And some folks have asked about Daryl Stewart. Daryl health is in it's not the best so uh we need to be praying for daryl we need to be praying for all the members of the florida boys at this time because uh even though we said he was a partner we all know who the who the brand for the florida boys were and uh what a leader what a marine we can't forget that served our country well and was a great veteran arthur anything else you want to say on on less before we close out no, I, I think everybody's played. You know, been a, it's been a great tribute to him, and uh, um, it just uh, just honoring his legacy, and uh, to know that that uh, what he worked so hard for is going to continue to go on because of the groundwork that he did, and uh, that set the stage for everybody to be able to excel. 
Go back and listen to some of the words that some of the icons of gospel music said about Les Beasley. Let's all take a little of Les with us, and God in uh, gospel music will be in a much better, better place for it. Yeah, Arthur, thank yeah. you so much. And hey, uh, you know what? Yeah, what's that? You, you know what? We, you know, we say every week. You know, what's wrong with living right, anyways? And that's exactly what Les did. No he doubt. took that to heart. And uh, there's not a thing wrong with it. Well, if nobody else has learned nothing in this whole process of talking about less, yours truly has. And I'm going to try to take a little bit of it with me in my business practices and uh, get better from it. And that's what Les would want us to do. Don't you agree? That's right. Absolutely. Pray- prayers to Miss Frances Clark and the entire Beasley family. To the Florida Boys family, thank you, Ed Harper. Thank you, Maurice Templeton. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Tim, Josh, uh, Gene. Gene. Thanks, Arthur, for your part. Ray Dean, thanks for your your part in it. And, uh, you know, it's just been fun. Arthur, we'll end it there. What's wrong with living right anyway, Arthur? Not a thing. All right, buddy. Thank you, man. (laughs) Uh, This is on uh, our uh, illustrious host of the evening. Um, no matter, uh, he's the and greatest. moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> he's the greatest in what he does, a, a real crowd pleaser. But it doesn't matter. Sometimes a crowd can get the best of you. And it did get the best of him one night in Long Beach. Uh, uh, I know that James was there, the Blackwood Statesman and the Florida Boys and uh, Jerry and his group. And Jerry's having a terrible time. And it wasn't his fault because the sound was really atrocious that night. People kept saying, turn it up, turn it down, turn it up, turn it down, turn it up, turn it down. Finally, Jerry said, you say, turn it up, turn it down, I'm going home. And he started to walk out. (laughs) And a lady in the audience said, good (laughs) night. Let me tell you. Now let me tell one on myself. In the same, same auditorium, we followed the Blackwoods and Statesman. That wasn't a good thing to do in the 60s. <laughs> and when we finished, I did my record plug, and I said, now, don't go home at intermission, because we always do better after intermission. And the lady, it may have been the same one, I don't know, she said, well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> Morning when the last trumpet got so sad. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Eternal praise, all bursting saints so sad. Heavenly beauty all around. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I'll have a new home of life eternal with the redeemed and God to sad. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, there'll be no more strife. Yes, raised in likeness of my Savior, ready to live in glory life. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I'll have a new home. Glory, glory, redeeming. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain. There'll be no more strife. Yes, raised in likeness of my Savior, ready to live in glory. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Well, I'll have a new home. Glory, glory, redeeming. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain. There'll be no more strife.
like me from my slavery to live for real life. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I'll have a new home, the black beat, or the real reading. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, there'll be no more strife. Yes, raised in likeness of my slavery to live for real life. I'll be glad. SGNP is excited you chose to listen today. If you'd kindly leave a remark and rating in the podcast remarks section, we surely would appreciate it. Please share with a friend or family member. Look for us on Facebook, Twitter, and our new website, southerngospelnewspodcast.com. To advertise your products, services, concert event, or new project on SGNP and reach a 100% guaranteed number of people in your area, call Tim Newton at 770-874-3200 or email him today, tnewton at bgadgroup.com. Let us geotarget our ads for you, something radio nor magazine can do. Hey, this is Darren Sutherland. Before I close... I want to thank our affiliates out there, WLJA in North Georgia, KWFC in Springdale, Arkansas, the new one, the Andrew Burnett Show, heard all across the country, and online, thelightatlanta.com, playing Southern Gospel music online. We're adding affiliates every day. We're partnering with Ken and the folks over there at Gospel Music TV real, real soon, so we look forward to that partnership. If your gospel music entity would love to partner with SGMP, get a hold of us. It's real simple. Folks, here's the the deal. We've reached out to literally every form of media in gospel music. If we've missed you, I'm sorry. But we've had great partnerships with folks like Paul Heil and others. If you haven't heard someone on the air, it's not because we hadn't reached out. We hope everyone is successful, no matter if they're a radio station, a magazine, a website, a group, whoever it is. God bless you, and let's make gospel music better than it was today, tomorrow. Easy enough?